Yes, kia ora whanau. No my heart my. Welcome back into our studio here in the garage. Run it straight. It's rugby league and it's finals, baby. And there was some cracker of rugby league being played. Welcome back, everyone. Ephraim, Willie's here. He's not in Townsville. And Dills. Kia ora, everyone. How are we? Kia ora. Yeah, pump. Well, finals footy, man. What a step up. It's awesome. Awesome that it's back around again. Pressure on some teams. Seasons are over and teams advancing through. So, yeah, lots of uh, good stuff to chat about here. Beautiful. Can't wait for this one. A real good show coming up, eh, Ephraim? It sure is. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I'm pretty tired because that Sunday game really took it out of me. You know, out of the soul, the, the Bulldogs are yeah. out now. They lost the three games after I bought the jersey. And now just, so. Your fault. I was going to say, I never saw the jersey come out. Hey, saving it for next season now. Okay, okay, Bulldogs okay. Bulldogs 2025, I'll be there day one, but... Sorry, guys. Uh, anyway, we'll move into the show. <laughs> we'll start off this week with actually some comments on last week's episode and see what you guys think about what the Yo. people have to say, you know. So first up, Clark Kent 2468 says, love the segment on the Samoan team. We need to talk. We need more talk on the international game, please. Especially now it's finals time. I'm loving the podcast, guys. So obviously we were talking about uh, Samoa and what's happening with them going to England. So he's appreciating that we talk about internationals. Are you guys keen to talk more about it, obviously, leading in, and you guys are both in the coaching space? Yeah, I, the, the international game is important to rugby league. It's important to the growth globally of our game, and um, it's where other sports have the jump on us. Mm -hmm. So if we're in our role here and in, in part of the show um, is to help promote that, then more for it. I'm happy. I love talking about the sport and rugby league in general, but international rugby league has to grow. And if we can help promote it, then I'm happy to do that. Yeah, it's it's given us, or given both of us, so much joy and pride and, and, a, and a place of purpose. And the more we can promote the game of rugby league, but also the international space, the more knowledge we can give to our fans like Clark Kent. Because us as Clark Kent, is that funny here? Superman, Superman. <laughs> Superman. The more we can give the knowledge to Superman himself, um, you know, we we as the Kiwi team need more international games. Um, we need the Anzac Test back. We need international football at the end of the year. So the more we can try and support it, the more our players can support it, the more we can talk about it, the greater it, for, it is for the game. So great question, Clark. Shout out Superman, man. Good good job. We'll see you hopefully saving people in, uh, in the world. Uh, the next question, Comment, boot the ball, cuz. Hey. Uh, this is a bit of a cracker. Would love to see you guys with Willie Mason and Horo. Invite them on, boys. Give them a hungy and talk some league. Both different styles, but would be a great watch with the personalities and stories. Make it happen for us fans. Give them that Kiwi Yo. style and ask Willie Mason about being knocked out in the test. Yeah, well, that was that um, test match at Mount Smart back then. Dave Kidwell, eh? I think it was in the Haka. I think that was one of my first test matches. I first come in when in 2006. Um, and I was just a kid um, enjoying, the, obviously, the contest. And you, I did see Willie Mason doing that. And David Kidwell come out of line and lined him up. But, um, yeah, a couple of great fellas. Obviously, um, you know, Hodor is uh, our fellow uh, Kiwi man. And, obviously, Willie Mason, big personality over in Australia and what they do on level. So, yeah, maybe one day we can try and get them on or we can jump into their stuff. <laughs> And mix a bit of the flavors together and see how we go. But um, I think there'll be a lot of laughing, to be honest. A lot of laughing, um, a lot of uh, winding back the clock and bringing back <laughs> memories. Most probably not too much of the present stuff, I think. But I think it would be a great uh, combination to obviously mix with the levels, boys, for sure. Great question, too. Yeah, collab would be awesome uh, for both. And we're still growing as a show, and they're pretty established. But be good to just to get around and. Talk shop with each other and, mm. and get some of their fans following us and hopefully some of ours following them. But yeah, they've they've got something going there. Hopefully we can go to Aussie and, and do it in mm. their backyard. We'll get the gears in motion for that uh boot the ball cuz uh, and see what happens. And then the last comment, Joe Natal six oh two seven. I would like the thoughts on Will Warbrick making the Kiwis squad this year on the wing. Hughes is a given. Let's go storm. Yeah, great, great question because I think and we did a live earlier this morning, which we do every Mondays before we go and do this, this show as well. And 
a lot of the questions around uh, Will Warbrick and if he fits into the the selections or even comes up. And and when you think about uh, Kiwi selections, I think you put out a squad of could be like thirty one or something, and there's a train on squad as well. He's definitely in considerations. Like you'd be silly not to think about Will Warbrick when it comes into considerations alongside Ronaldo, who I thought they had a great battle on the weekend as well. So um, definitely in consideration. I think he's been uh, playing some great footy and he, he stepped up his game in the last few games. He had an injury there during the season as well. Come back and scored some really good tries on the back of, like he said, Jerome Hughes, who's I think is a given all, all things that he stays healthy for sure. Yeah, I watched him on the weekend and... I just marvelled again at another player in their group that mm. under Craig Bellamy has just blossomed in two years. In two seasons in rugby league, he's become one of the best wingers in the comp and, you know, came from sevens beforehand. And it made me think about the wingers that they've lost in the meantime. You know, they had Vunivalu not so long mm. ago who was, like himself, a prolific try scorer and one of the best wingers at the time. Kuro Kura Betty, um, um, Mai Fonua before that. Yes. So many strong wingers that have come through and hit the hit a peak under that and in that system. He's another one. I, I think he's a shoe in for the for the Kiwis. I think he's a must be in their squad and be there or thereabouts on the form. And if they go deep, mm. go into the grand final, even more reason to pick him. Do you think he displaces so obviously Asako is the right winger, uh, has been the right winger if Who's the goal kicker if he does displace Osako? Because that's uh, obviously something that he Yeah, well, that, that's the biggest question, eh, when it comes to goal kickers, especially for Kiwis uh, and Kiwi players or international players. Um, because Jermaine obviously was the winger, the incumbent last year, and done a really good job at it, and is a great kicker as well. And I guess that's why they have Daryl Halligan on the staff as well, is, is that he works with a lot of players in the NRL. I think one time there they had uh, Jordan Rapana kicking, who did a really good job as well. So it, it can be done. It can be done. I think if there's some players in the in the team that gets selected has done some sort of kicking, then there's an opportunity there for Daryl Halligan to work alongside them. But, uh, you know, going back to the the question on Will Walbrook, I think he's yeah close to at the moment, playing some of his best football of his career. And like Willie said, only two years in. Uh, shout out to all of those three guys for the comments. Keep the comments coming on on this week's episode and every other episode, and I'll chuck in some every week from now on. Because uh, we love the engagement, guys. How good. Uh, moving on to the news. So starting off with some transfer news, I'll just give you a couple headlines. Horsburgh, Corey Horsburgh. Staying at the Raiders now after last week we talked about Royce Hunt wanting him to come with him to the Tigers. He said, nah, don't want that. Don't want the Dragons. I'm staying at the Raiders. Uh, the Broncos are apparently after Christian Welsh. So obviously lackluster season, looking to get some more experience yep. back in the team. And then the big one, Jazz Tivanga is uh, apparently signed on a one-year deal to Manly for next season. What do you guys think of those of that news? Yeah, well, after Canberra's last game, Ricky Stewart was quite cryptic about what was going to happen with Corey Horsburgh, um, saying that his next movement will be his decision, that he wanted him to stay. So maybe something at the time had been sorted and he knew that he was going to come back and stay with them. But, yeah, it's uh, unfortunate for the Tigers. They miss out on someone else to add to their stocks. He's... Uh, He's a firebrand of a player who didn't play a lot. He got some opportunities and we spoke about that freakish try that he scored. Um, and he's been around the Origin Arena. So I, I think he'll focus on having a big preseason and get those opportunities that he missed out upon this year. And Ricky Stewart obviously knows what he's able to bring. Jazz is a great signing for Manly. Um, great for him. I'm happy he's got something sorted, albeit just for a year. He gets an opportunity to get into a system brand new to him. It'll be very strange mm. for him after being at the Warriors so long to go somewhere different and everything, the environment and the culture is totally different to what he knows at the Warriors. But once he comes to grips with it, I'm sure he'll be a sensation for them. And that year could grow on to many more. Christian Welsh sort of coming to the back end and they've been chasing. The Broncos missed out on Regan Campbell-Gillard by all accounts. They're after a big body. Mm -hmm. um, they need a big body. They've lost Flegler. 
and uh, Payne Haas has been in and out through injury this year, so they need some bodies and some experience, which is what they've missed out on this year. They've relied heavily on on Adam Reynolds to be that old head. I think an old head around the middle could be good for them too. Yeah, I you know I couldn't see Corey Holsborough going anywhere else but the Canberra Raiders. <laughs> Although you know Royce Hunt said he'd love to have him at the West Tigers, I just feel like he is the Raiders. Um, and a lot of his stuff, and unfortunately this year hasn't been his best year about playing, like obviously being in the first grade team, but the last, I think the last three games he played, I thought he was real good. He get, added some some starch to their pack, a little bit of, little bit of mongrel to their pack as well. So I think uh, great signing for, for the Canberra. And like you said, if it was his decision, his decision was always going to be, I think, to stay at the Canberra Raiders. And they obviously built some good relationships down there. Obviously, things may have felt fallen out of place during the year, but somehow found himself back in there. The biggest, I guess, the learnings from watching from afar is that he never kicked stones when he went down to reserve grade. He, he found his way back into the, the important part of the year for the Canberra Raiders and going out on a high with that, obviously, the trial we spoke about. So I think good lessons. He went, worked, went back, worked hard, didn't kick stones, and got, his, got himself back into the NL squad to manage to be able to play those last three games, which I thought was a big part of the Canberra Raiders surge in those last three games. You talk about Jazz, uh, man, could fit into any team, I think, than any team that wanted him. And I think, you know, you look at some of the players that they have, uh, the Manly Seagulls, and what he could add in amongst that team off the bench or whether he starts, uh, I think he'll be a great, he's a great signing for the Manly Seagulls. A year, he's going to have to work hard. Like you said, it's going to be a different environment for Jazz. He's spent most of his time, all of his football career here in New Zealand at the Warriors. He gets opportunity to go to Australia, different environment, maybe a different style of football play too, uh, mixing in with a lot of different um, cultures, you know, but I think he'll fit in with a lot of those other boys as well, some of the Samoan and the Tongan boys in that Manly squad. So I think it's a great uh, pickup for Jazz because I think he can add value to most of the teams that he goes to. And then obviously the Broncos looking for some leadership. Uh, I think we know that through the middle of the pack. Someone like Christian Wush can add that. I think he's been hindered with a little bit of, I guess, injuries and not being able to play this year. But he is a quality player. He's an origin player. He is getting to the back end. But I think the Broncos need some old heads around those, some of those younger guys to to keep them on the straight and narrow, but also to bring that experience and knowledge around, you know, what it takes to win in a culture as well. So I think he'll um, pull a lot of those young boys into place, especially in the middle of the pack for sure. Well, speaking of uh, experience and knowledge, on to the next headline. Uh, Jared Hayne is reportedly set to possibly come back to rugby league after obviously being out for a few years. Uh, in the way of the Fiji national team. So the coach, Wise Kativarata, has said that he is pretty keen to have Jared Hayne at 36 years old come hop into Fiji's national team for the Pacific uh, yeah. Bowl coming up. What would that? What do you reckon will happen with that, you guys? If it's a publicity stunt, it's a very, very good one because <laughs> it's already instigated some conversation. <clears throat> And um, there's no doubt, and he's been the best Fijian and most well-known Fijian player ever. And if he's still got some burning desire, if he can, if he's been training from the time that he was released a couple of months ago and up until now, and he's fit and his mind's ready to go, then maybe for some reason, um, as long for mine as it doesn't come at the expense of someone who deserves to be there. Mm. If there's a young player that's playing well, you know, if it comes at the expense of losing someone like him, then I probably don't agree with it. But if if there is no one and the coach sees a genuine spot open mm. to carry someone like Jared in there, then by all means, it'd be a great one. Because they've got Jareem Buller as well. Jareem Buller who would, like if you're saying Jared may play fullback, I'm just saying, even if he's in the squad, I think, like you said, Willie, I think it comes down to Jared and whether he's got the hunger and the desire to put the jersey back on and play rugby league again. He wouldn't have been happy with the way he left the game and he's much had a lot of time to think about it. And like you said, again, if he's been training since his time, uh, I know that he does a lot of stuff with um, Roger Fabry, the sprint yep. coach down in Sydney. So when it comes to, I guess, the running side of things, I know he'd be putting in the work, the contact's a different, different space. But... Like you said, I think he's been 
if not one of the best Fijian players to put on the jersey in that international space uh, for, for their country. So whether it's media, whether it's a desire to play one or the other, I think it'd be great for Fiji, but also not to take someone else's position. Eh? So, yeah, not, not a bad a thought if this is where he wants to get into. He may even want to get into the coaching space as well. So maybe like a role in and around, in and around the Fijian space rather than the player as well. You know, having his leadership and his knowledge of the rugby league game, and man, he was in his prime 2009. It's been a long time since then, but you don't lose that knowledge from the game. No. Um, and like I said earlier, he's had a lot of time to think about it. Yep. I think he's important to the Fiji culture and the Fiji team to be in and around that space anyway. So, yeah, not a bad thought on a, on a comeback for him. And, hey, returning at 36 years old as well, maybe uh, could give other ideas for retired players to help out in the <laughs> Maybe Māori's, but not the Kiwi's. Um, next up, also in the international space, Lebanon versus France uh, had a two-game series scheduled. It was confirmed, and then three days later, they just cancelled both games. The reason being because uh, Lebanon are basically unable to field a team because the games were the first game was a week out from the grand final. Obviously, Lebanon. Almost all of their players play NRL or at least uh, lower level of NRL teams uh, for their professions. So they are unable to be released by the NRL. So basically there was no team to play the game. Um, France, I think, also had a similar thing, but it's more they're saying it's more just the Cedars, Lebanon's team that can't field a team, so the game's been called off. Um, so... What do you guys think about scheduling these series mm. immediately following the grand final, the importance of the NRL to the international space as well? Last week, I spoke about this on my radio show, there was, uh, there's, I think, two or three international weekends in football around the world. So every co local competition stops. The Premier League stopped. We've got to have a look at that as a game of having a window where all the international teams play. Now, if we can fit in England going, Samoa going to England and the Kiwis and Tonga play in Australia, then we can surely fit in mm. Lebanon and France in that window as well. Why we would try and squeeze it in at the end of uh, a week after our grand final, I don't get it. I don't get it. The, you know, the, it's not fair on the coaches mm. of those teams. They get players who, who come underprepared. Obviously, if the game was in France, then those guys who you're talking about, the Aussies who represent Lebanon that live and play in Australia, have to fly all the way over. That takes it out of them. After only you know, you only get given a couple of days prep then to prepare for a test match, was which isn't fair and isn't right. So we've got to be fair to all these teams, not just the big ones. We've got to be fair if we really want the game to glow globally. We've got to be fair internationally to all these teams as well. Um, France, I understand their argument that if that's the case, if Catalan make the grand final in the Super League, that's mm. most of their team. That's most of their team they're playing. So again, that doesn't give them much much time to rest and recover after, after the height of making a grand final, especially if they win it. Yeah, I 100% I agree with you. Having... Like we we want to promote the game of rugby league and we want to promote that international space. We want to make it an equal opportunity for everyone to be able to be represented, not just, like you said, the bigger nations. Uh, and putting it a week after grand final just doesn't make sense because like we've, like you've said and like you said, Israel, is that the teams that get knocked out in round 26 or round 27, they've got four or five weeks of no football being played. No football being played. So this now then becomes, when you want to go into a... a a competition, an international game, a week after grand final, it becomes an RLPA problem because they're going to say that the players uh, aren't fit enough, they haven't done any, they've got no Ks under their legs, although they've had 26 or 27 weeks of training, but they'll go from finishing their game to going on holiday, then trying to come back and trying to get them fit for a one-off test match, which then becomes, again, uh, a club's problem because then they're going to say, well, they finished, they've started their holiday last week and 
you stop them and you put them into a camp and adds another extra week onto their, their holiday, which the clubs are going, no, no, we want them to start November 1. And if they go into camp, that's an extra week, so they've got to start November 7. So there's too much um, grey area when you have a game after the grand final. I think I think the, the Tongan team and the Australian team are running into something similar. They're going into a camp pretty much the week after the grand final to play the week later, not the week after the grand final. So even their preparation is quite limited as well. But the, the thing for me is the Aussies can put four or five teams together if that's exaggerating, but you know, two quality teams and still compete at that level because of the quality and the numbers of players that they have. So I just don't think if we're trying to encourage this in the international space, which we want, um, and everyone else that plays international football, then putting them straight after the grand final does not work at all. And it just you you you're trying to sell this game of rugby league and you want this game to grow. We're not doing it adva- any we're giving it, it's in a disadvantage for our players that play in their space because of the short amount of preparation they go into to play for your country. So somehow I don't I don't blame like, you know, those teams can't put teams together, players in there, because of everything else that the players can't do or they haven't been able to do because of the timing. So it's tough and we want them to play, but the game hasn't allowed them to. Because this is an embarrassment. You know, really, for the game to name a test match and then a couple of days later pull the pin on it. You know, it's not a good look on no. on the game at all. Yeah, definitely not. So hopefully, the International Rugby League can uh, get that sorted out uh, because the NRL definitely aren't having problems with this next headline. <laughs> NRL viewership has hit record heights uh, over Fox tells linear and digital platforms which is basically that's more australia obviously sky in new zealand does uh the nrl for us i don't think that's counted in this so outside of that just in australia ko sports the main platform being was the viewership was up by 30 percent from last year five billion minutes were streamed across all the platforms uh 59 percent of the total audience were streaming nrl Obviously, the season started with those Vegas games, the first Vegas games. The first game had 838,000 people watching it live. So up and up for the NRL at the moment in terms of viewership. Yeah, win-win. Win-win for everyone. It's a win for Peter Volandes and whose idea it was to go to Vegas. It's a win for the NRL community. Um, Obviously, they're being given the opportunity to watch more games. I know in the UK a lot of people use the Watch NRL app mm-hmm. to stream and, and watch yeah. the games live. And with that, they get the access to the Matty John shows and every show that Fox do. So that will affect some of these numbers as well. But it's a win for the players. It's a win for the players because the more people that watch, the more people that pay, the NRL are an organisation that feed these numbers back. So the Players Association and agents are saying – okay, there's more money in the pool, we need to come back to the play. So it's a win for everyone and great that the popularity of the game is growing, hence why we've seen the expansion coming through. Mm -hmm. Sounds like Perth are going to come in. So the game as a whole is growing and that's great. We're just going to help it on that domestic level grow internationally. Well, the, the game is moving really quick, moving really quick and that's a credit to everyone involved, including the players. Uh, when you can take a game to Vegas and, and can sign a contract there for five years and you see these numbers in the viewership, you can see how much people want to be involved in this game. Uh, but also, when you think about the Australia market when it comes to NRL, they are on TV 24-7. There is a show on in Australia. But the thing is, the kids through the schools live and breathe rugby league. So it's, become, it's ingrained into the people from the, the young ages of five years old or even younger. And it just becomes something that they just switch on automatically. It just becomes muscle memory. It's like the game's on Thursday. The Matty John shows on, 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 on Monday or, you know, 360's on. Like there's something on all the time. And now the female space is on. So you, they're capturing an audience of so many who are then bringing their eyes straight into the viewership, into the game of rugby league and... Man, obviously the players create this this cool brand of rugby league and they play the game. And on the back of that, 
the NRL sells it. And I think, like like Willie said, everyone's winning. Everyone's winning, including the fans. And the numbers don't lie. And it's exciting because the game's only getting bigger, and it's only and it's only growing even more. And uh, you know, once we played it, it wasn't as big as that, but it was still big. It's only going to get even bigger. So, uh, no, massive congratulations to to everyone, even the fans as well, because the fans make the game as well. They are so important to the game of rugby league. And the more people we come in watching, the more fans turn up to games, the better it is for the rugby league. Yeah, it was the uh, seventh consecutive year of upwards growth uh, in viewership. So, yeah, anyone, everyone who's watching our channel, I assume, is a bit of a league here already, but... Just tell your friends. Can we get family. some viewer? Can we get some audience like that? Some viewership like that? Are we going up? <laughs> yeah. Are we actually yeah, growing or are we just staying just uh, you know holding? Yeah, we're growing. We're growing. Yeah, yeah, we're growing. One person at a time. <laughs> hey, that little one percenter helps my men. Um, last bit of news: the uh, the next batch of club awards. Obviously, last week we talked about the Warriors ones. They were the only ones out. Uh, a few more clubs have released theirs, so I'll just go through a couple of the notable ones. Uh, the Bulldogs, their George Perponis Award, Player of the Year, was Viliami Kikau. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Crichton took home Members Player of the Year and Club Person of the Year. The Titans, Keanu Kinney was their Player of the Year. Sea Eagles, uh, Tom Trebojevic, their Player of the Year. Lehigh Hopwide, Rising yeah. Star. Parramatta Eels, Regan Campbell-Gillard on his last mm. season for the club, won the Player of the Year and... I believe Blaise, the play. Oh no, Blaise sorry, Clint, Clint Gutherson was the player's Blaise player. Uh, Blaze Talangi, obviously rookie of the year as well. Oh. Rabbitohs, Jack Whiten, player of the year. Jai Gray, rookie of the year, and the Dragons had Jaden Sewer as their player of the year in his return to Origin. You guys agree with the clubs there for their players of the year? Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, Regan Campbell Gillard is probably the surprise one mm. out of that one. Um, the fact that he's leaving the club, but they've seen fit. And some sometimes that happens when a new coach comes in. He's coming with his ideas and Jason Riles is going to make some changes. And unfortunately, one of the victims of that is their current player of the year, Regan Campbell-Gillard, who uh, hopefully kicks on next year wherever he goes. But yeah, I agree with some of those, especially Keanu Kinney, who's been outstanding mm. at the Gold Coast and really able to kick out right from week one. And we spoke about it during the season. That left edge of the dogs has been threatening all season long and a big part to what he's done. Now he's had some support and been given the balls from Matt Burton and had Bronson Cherry outside of him as well as Ado Carr for most of the year. But some of the runs and the indentations that he's made and some of the defensive lines have been outstanding. Yeah, I think he's, yeah, for me, epitomises the, the style of football the Bulldogs played this year is that he's he's competed on everything and a prime example we'll talk about it later like some of his kick chases a lot of those times when players are getting dropped off underneath he's the first one down some kick that some charge downs some of his carries have been huge some of the tries he scored have been enormous so there's no doubt that he is the the best player for them this year Keanu Kitty like Willie said been enormous like I think second year in the NRL and getting an opportunity to play at fullback is must be the most, like he said, and I think more so the confidence that it's given the kid to be able to play. And he is just a kid; like he's only young. He's got a bright future, so he deserves the the the, the big medal there at the Gold Coast. Tom Trevojevic, yep, I think he's been solid. You know what I mean with the amount of games that he's played in and out, but he's still been a big part of what they do. Without him on the field, they struggle. Um, yeah, I think like like Willie said, Regan Campbell Gillard, I. I actually find it hard to try and pick the best player for 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 them, and I think you know alongside Blaze Talangi, I reckon, you know, although he got rookie there, he could have gone close to being one of their better players uh, for them for the year, like the most consistent. I know he got pulled into a positions and, and played in a lot of different positions, and done the best with what he had through some tough times as well. So, yeah, if you think about it, there, there could have been an argument there, and I think that's just you know that's my opinion. Jack White, an enormous. So as soon as he got into that sixth position, that's that's his position on the, on on the on the move next year for Wayne Bendis to play him in and around the ball. He was strong. Jaden Sawyer, Origin, most really his best year as well. Origin for the for the Dragons. So yeah, some some. Some big name players taking up those awards for their clubs. Shout out to all of those guys. Uh, 
were you guys club award winners when you were you know in your careers what what were the awards that you were picking up at the end of the season for your teams nah did it, I don't even think I got any awards my bro none nah I don't think so I can't even remember to be honest <laughs> no no I played that long ago I can't remember either don't think so unless someone knows that was down at the Melbourne store <laughs> no. you know that I picked up award down there but I don't think I picked up any awards totally. I know, I just, just a team member just a team member yeah. <laughs> the player's player is the one you want yeah the player's player you know you want the accolades and the praise from your peers that's, you know, to a player, that's the most valuable award. It's nice to get the recognition as player of the year, and I'm not just saying this because I never got it, <laughs> but it's nice to get the other awards, but the player's player, that's yeah. special. I, it's funny you say that. I spoke to um, Jerome Hughes last week on a pod, another podcast that I do, and um, I asked the same question, you know what I mean? Is there anyone, like we said, and I said, like, you are the best player in the competition this year. You should win Delhi. And do you think there's anyone else in the NRL that you think will compete with you at their level? He said, oh, I don't even watch rug- I don't even watch that much rugby league. And he goes, Barry, you know how much footy we watch down in Melbourne. I said, no, nah, I 100% agree. And he said, the last thing was he said is, like, I would rather, although that's a great accolade winning the Delhi M, the player's player being chosen, he goes, I'd rather have that because of the respect that the players have for you as a player. So... In comparison, and just trying to obviously talk about our conversation here around, you know, winning the best player for the club or the player's player, like players put a lot of emphasis on being the player's player. Yeah, because the the players you work with day in and day out, they know the trials and tribulations and Mm. the roller coaster you ride through the course of a season Mm. with each other. So they have a true vision of what your experience has been and what you've had to go through to put mm. in the performances. And it's more about the respect, mm. the respect they show you when you get yeah. that award. Yeah. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the games of the first round of finals, starting off on the Friday, the Panthers versus the Roosters, 30-10 to the Panthers. Uh, your guys' predictions, obviously we did those at the end of last week. Yeah. Adam, you said Roosters, 24-18, uh, Willie, you said Panthers by 12. And you had Jerome Luai as the man of the match, I think, where they were saying Nathan Cleary, and obviously Cleary was pretty good in that game. Uh, up the Panthers, that's all I got on that one, mate. Up the Panthers. We're going yeah. all the way, baby. Yeah, up the Panthers, bro. Like, yeah, I for me, I was, you know, this is me just chucking it out there. And, and most people be thinking, I thought the Roosters were going to be better than what they did. But again, the Penrith Panthers were ruthless. Like that that's that's what it was in the end. It was a team that was ruthless with everything they did. They blew the Roosters off the park in the first 20 minutes. And when you look at it, it was much really silly me going against them. Maybe I just wanted to try and just chuck a smoky out there and just ruffle some feathers and stuff as well. Um, but when you think about how many times they've played in big matches over the last five years, like they are enormous. They just get it. They understand what what what's needed. They they turned up and just from the get go was just they were just ruthless in their runs, ruthless defensively, ruthless in their execution. They they didn't take the pedal, the foot off the throat right through that game. Maybe the last part, you know, the the Roosters get a, some tries in the corners and. But I just think when you look at the Penrith Panthers and the quality of players that they have, and then on the back of what you said, Nathan Cleary coming back, and you know, everyone must said, oh, you know, how's he going to go? Jerome Hughes, oh, Jerome Luai, sorry, Jerome Luai is going to have to take a little bit of control here. No way. Nathan Cleary stepped up, come out of the line, I think, first tackle on Crichton and just try to whack him just to make sure that his shoulder's all good. And, mate, they just kicked into to gear and just get, gave gave. The Roosters are a bit of a lesson on finals football, really. And when you play enough finals football consistently, you know what you need to do. And that that week off is important. A week off is important. And they know how important it is. You go balls out. You put you put everything into this one game, you get a week off. You put everything into the next game, you're into the GF. So you take it game by game, but you have to front load everything you have. And the next week, they, the week that, two weeks time they play, they'll do exactly the same thing because they know – that the opposition have had two tough games. Then they come to the Penrith Panthers again and they're just going to blow them off the field again. They're just going to be a hard team to beat, especially when you get to grand final because they've played in, they'll be, have, they would have played in five. 
that would be their fifth one coming in. And man, man, they are enormous, that club and what they've been able to do. But the performance they put in, boom, see you later. Roosters, straight off the bat. Yeah, not just five, five on the trot, if that's the case. And that's ridiculous in the modern day. Mm. You know, in a salary cap era, with all the players they've had to lose and move on. But I spoke about it at the top of the show, just being excited about playoffs being around and playoffs being here and the change in intensity throughout all the games over the weekend. And it kicked off on Friday. They just changed gears, the Panthers. They just played a different style of football at a different level to what they've done. And there were some question marks coming yeah. in, especially when they were a bit jittery against the, the Titans last week. But they they just shift the gear right from the off and they put the roosters to the sword. And my question is still the same, and I'll say it every week, and people watching this don't get sick of me because I question the, the roosters' defence, mm. especially when they're under the pump. You know, when they were coming in waves, Jerome Luai and Nathan Cleary were just running rings around them and putting the ball wherever they needed to be. Mm. They got those threats on the, on the Liam edges. Liam Martin was a beast. Liam Martin was awesome. And then the second half, a little yeah. bit even, but even then there was a moment where the Roosters were sort of getting some ascendancy, but Nathan Cleary kicks the ball down. We're talking about Liam mm. Martin. His kick chase yeah. bashes Tedesco, and then they just their line speed from then on. You know, they, they fell away in their intensity for a moment, but they just changed gears with their defence. Boom, 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 got the ball back up the field and they scored again. That's them. They know how to get it done. They don't lose focus. Uh, whilst they've not been at their best throughout the year, and maybe a Nathan Cleary thing, him coming back and giving them confidence, but they just know what this time of year is about, and this is what makes them dangerous. Some demons for the <coughs> Roosters. Uh, they've, they've got some players missing, I know that, mm. but they didn't have it their way. They've got a tough one coming up this week, and the, the week off, as Blairy saying, huge, huge for the for the Panthers after what's been a long season to be able to focus and go into your mindset and say, oh, we've got two games. We've got two games left. Mm. Let's just go leave it all behind. Yeah, and I think, you know, Moses Lealta and James Fish Harris, like those guys, they've played in so many big games. They just know and understand and lead by example what they need to do in these finals games because far out, they were just flying out of the line, just getting stuck. And, in, and that Roosters pack is in a small pack. Like, there's some tough players through there, but they just gave them nothing. They just, like I said before, they were ruthless with everything that they did. You know, from Jerome Luai to Nathan Cleary to, to um, Liam Martin with his kick chase to everyone that was on the field, you know, to Ruva carrying the ball at the back, Edwards doing what he does. And they know how important it is to win that first week, to get that week out of the way and then just, you know, not take the foot off the pedal, but just put everyone on ice Get ready to go again for one more game because you know the other teams are going to be bashed. You know they're going to be bruised because if you just saw that game, like the intensity only goes up again. So every time a team plays, like you, the next two teams that play, next four teams that play, they are playing for to be knocked out. So it's do or die. It's like playing a grand final every single week until you get to the yeah. grand final. And then it's like, man, good luck to those teams that have gone the long way around when you've got two quality teams who are one and two watching everyone just bash each other and they've got all their players healthy and fit, sitting there waiting to go, or if they're not, just keeping them on ice and getting them ready. So, man, they were ruthless and such a well-oiled machine and just the club that just knows how to get it done this time of the year. I thought what else it, it allowed them, having Nathan Cleary back with Jerome Luai, it allowed Isaiah Yar oh. to run. It allowed him to be threatening through that middle of the yep. park. Obviously, he's got his ball-playing ability, but he ran a lot more and the pressure of having to ball play was released mm. a little bit more because Nathan Cleary stepped up to the mark, especially on that right-hand side, and it opened up his run thread mm. a lot more. You know, he still played the ball, but when it was on to go, he just went and yeah. he, he was so good through the middle of the park and back to his, uh, his running best in the game when I heard that he broke the record as the highest panther and appearances. E so equaled awesome. Steve Carter's appearance record for the club, 243 games. That yeah, I, I knew he'd been around, but that's a few games. Well, I, I did say that he would he would benefit mostly from having Nathan back because 
you can see him trying to do a lot of the stuff and trying to help Jerome Luai out with the way that the team is organised. But you know that he is the connection from the middle to both edges, you know what I mean? But then, like you said, it allows him to just have that support there, whether he plays, whether he runs himself or rolls at the back to the one yep. of the halves. Like, it opens his game up. It gives him confidence. It gives the team confidence. Nathan Cleary is back in the field. You can see the lift in everyone, you know? So... As long as well as as long as those three are on the field, things will just work out perfectly. Um, for the Panthers, they also equaled a record: the most consecutive finals victories in a mm. row, ten. Obviously, wow. three. They would have won three in a row in each of the past three years, and this was now the tenth game in a row in the finals that they've won. It's not something we're probably going to see again for a long time after them. So even if they don't win the whole premiership this year. Still massive props to them. And then also a shout-out that I want to make is to Connor Watson on the Roosters. Made 69 tackles, obviously having to play hooker without Brandon Smith and then, you know, Sam Walker out as well. A lot of troops down. He was just a standout in, on the stat sheet for the Roosters. Um, but unlucky Roosters, bro. It's all Panthers here, baby. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Next game, Storm versus Sharks at Amy Park. An even bigger win, 37-10 to 10 to the Storm. Your guys' mm. predictions, Adam, Storm, 34-22. Willie, Storm by 16. Both you guys said Jerome Hughes. I mean, yeah, pr probably the easiest one to predict out of all the games, and the Storm got it done. They sure did. Uh, and most probably, and when you, if you compare the, the night before, um, did it in a different style, eh? Uh, they did it most probably in a, in, a, in a Melbourne way where they just slow death the opposition, where they take him into the deep ends and just just keep pinning him down, keep making him make mistakes. And then when they come home, they come home strong and just blow him off the park. And I think that's I think that's the, the Melbourne Storm blueprint is where they, you know, you think you're in there, but they start with your opposition. They just keep completing high. They put you into the corner, and then hopefully in the back end of that last 20 minutes, you gas out and you can't have anything to attack. The Sharks let themselves down. Uh, couldn't kick a ball out of the full. A lot of errors, um, getting stuck with the, the end of set plays. Um, that, that's when, when you come to finals football, you cannot make those mistakes like everything has to be near perfect where it means to be able to compete with these better teams and if you were to watch the storm uh, through the last you know eight weeks they've been ruthless in attack and scoring a lot of points and when it comes to finals football their defense goes the the the, the, the attack comes the defense just goes through the roof and i thought they just suffocated them through there by competing completing putting them in the corners having all the position uh, making them come off their trial line and then causing the errors. And then when the moments come, you, you, your guns stand up. And the, the prime example, the kickoff. You know what I mean? That, that is a coach killer. You know what I mean? I see a lot of that just in local stuff. But this is the NRL. Like, you don't expect people not to not to catch a ball in the first week one of, of finals and not be at a depth where you can catch a ball. Like, that is a coach killer, especially when you're trying to start a finals game. You, the intensity has already gone up. The fans are there. They're, they're going to be in behind it. But you've got to catch balls on the full. And I think for all our kids out there, is making sure, you know, that's important message is catch a ball on the full. Uh, don't let the ball bounce because anything can happen. But that was a prime example of the Sharkies night, I thought. They'd they, they were they done well enough to stay in the game. They scored a try just before half time, And it was most probably a bit of a... Um, Bit of a smokes and mirrors, I think, you know what I mean? Like where they thought they were in it, but the Melbourne Storm were just too ruthless in everything they'd done. And, you know, Pappenhausen back playing, Jerome Hughes, well, Warbrook was huge. And then obviously, um, if I had a mind, the hooker. Hunt. Harry Grant. Harry, Harry Grant. Grant. You, did you say Hunt? <laughs> Holy <Hulk. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> And obviously Harry Grant scoring three tries on the back of some of the effort from Ali Katoa as well. But the momentum... Created by just playing bang, 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 bang. And then when Harry Grant found the space to run, he just primed, primed himself, put him into a position, ducked around the middle of the park, in the right place at the right time, scores tries. And another ruthless storm performance, I thought, when, 
you know, the Sharkies may have thought they were in it, but gassed them out by the end of that second half and come away with 37. And, you know, it's always great to be practising field goals come this time of the year as well. Um, so they put a put a field goal in, Pippenhausen kicks it, and easy, you know what I mean? But important that, you know, you get those moments because if you're winning by that much and there's an opportunity to kick one, you might as well get some practice in. And everyone this time of the year is practising anyway because... You never know what's going to happen in the game, eh? And if you're not prepared to do it, if you don't set yourself up in the right field position, you don't give yourself opportunities. So, you know, 30, 37 to 10, like, that is dominant, as well as obviously seeing the result the night before. Yeah, 14-10 at half time. You think that the Sharks were still in the fight. Then you look at the stats, mm. and Melbourne only had 41% of the football, I thought. But with that 41%, they were 20 out of 20. And exactly what Blair is saying, they were just slow, slowly killing them away you know, with the pressure. They come out the second half, and the first half was all, I liked how they shared the responsibility, the Melbourne Storm, of leading the team. First half, it was all Cam Munster. Mm. Yeah, he was had his hands on the ball and was running them ragged, directing the team. Second half, Jerome Hughes, he stepped up to the plate, and that, that allowed Harry Grant to come into his own. And I thought uh, they just really squeezed it. It took him 15 minutes, I think, mm. before Jack Howell dropped the ball. But uh, they didn't get flustered. There was a bit of mis miscommunication. And I don't know if Harry Grant thought Munster was going to get yeah. it and Munster thought um, Howell was, but they were just in each other's way. Fix it up, back to it, go again and just score a try after try after that. But agreed, Ali Kartor was outstanding. I think the back rowers today... Started with Liam Martin uh, probably a year or two ago. Just the kick chases and the ability to put pressure on the back, on the fullbacks and the wingers of the opposition. Ali Kartor not only putting pressure, it's but the competing, bro. It's the jumping. Yeah, it's the competing because long of the days now you just run down and stand there, you know what I mean? Like you got back rowers that can jump, they're athletic, they can compete Skillful. for the ball. And some of them are a lot bigger than the fullbacks, yep. as in the height difference as well. So these guys. Like, I like it. Like, they're going down there and competing. They're a target. They're an option. So, yeah, sorry, Willie, I just jumped in. No. But he's the man. Well, and I'm, I'm squeezing as a fullback, seeing, yeah. seeing some of them big fellas running down and hearing their footsteps coming as you're trying to catch the ball. So, But skillfully, he's done it time and time again. Remember him doing it at yeah. the Warriors well, here. It also means that when uh, you got centers in on the opposition blocking, they're always looking for the opposite center or the opposite to winger. Escort. To escort them off the ball. But now these back rowers are coming, so you can't escort everyone on, no. on the side. So you can escort two people, but you can't escort a third. So you've got to be real smart, and you've got to be precise where you kick the ball too, on who you're targeting and who's going to get up. But they just seem to have a good connection on what they want to do. And he's obviously become a target for them, as, long, as well as Will Warbrick in the corners. Ali Kato's become a target both playing short or even going up and competing for. So it's, yeah. it's crazy. You talk about like sharing the load. Like, you always know Cameron Munster's going to find himself in the game. And much the one that last week's game, he just let Jerome Hughes run a show. But you thought, nah, well, you know, on the back of that first try he scored in, within a couple of minutes, you knew he was there for, for the night, you know, that yeah. he's going to be running the ball and he tests him. Like you said, he tests him every single time, bro. Yeah, talking about him being pinpoint that kick from Jerome Hughes to Warbrick. Mm. Could see that Mulatalo had come up into the line and there was heaps of space... A little bit too far, it goes dead. Yeah. And a little bit too close, then Mulatalo probably gets the ball. Crazy. But it's just in the right spot, and you could see how frustrated Mulatalo was. He's, like, He's got me, he just picked my pocket, he could see it. They played it all wrong, but it came off quick plays. They were short for numbers. Mulatalo had to try and get up just in case they passed, but Jerome Hughes, just as he's done all year, read it, right spot, just kicked it. They get the week off now. Mm. They get the week off. Unfortunately for the Sharks, I think it's seven playoffs now in a row. That's a mm. big monkey on their back. Yeah, That's a big hoodoo to try and shake off. And now the difference is, whilst they had two lives, it's nice, it's losers playing winners. It's teams coming in the back of confidence now. They're playing teams that finished lower in the comp, but they're coming off a bad loss, a denting loss, a morale denting loss. We'll just see how they are mentally when they go and play next week. And I look at, obviously, the Melbourne Storm and, 
and the Penrith Panthers. And you look at those four teams that are playing this weekend, I actually can't see them beating those two come semi-final. I just think, you know, alongside the Cowboys, who must be looked the the better one out of the the other three, the other games, I think, man, it's going to be tough to beat those two teams that are resting up. And maybe for me, I kind of think it's most probably the easiest run those two teams will have that I've seen in a long time. Not saying that they're they're bad, but I just don't think. Oh, it's similar to last year. Yeah, it's, it's similar to last year for me. There's a gulf between the top two and the yeah. rest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, last year it was the Broncos and Penrith, and yeah. you could see how much they won those two games, yeah. 26 nil or something like that yeah. last year. <clears throat> There's a gulf. There's a big difference to the intensity that those two teams are able to play yeah. at. Because you got the Roosters who, who are injured. You know they they haven't got their best team on the field. You got you got the Sharks who. You know, struggled at this time of the year, had been struggling with their performances coming off a loss. You got the Cowboys who are, are going okay and, and could shake it up a little bit. And then who's the other team? Um, Manly. Manly, who, man, if you saw Tom Travojevic's game, the start was real slow. He looked sore, obviously got a needle at half time and then gone up another gear. Like, there is some big name players that are either missing or have some nickels in there. They're going to have to carry few, carry through to the semis. I just don't see them. Don't see them pushing the other teams. I just don't see them pushing uh, Melbourne and Penrith. Just purely on some of the injuries that they have to key players, and also injuries that the people are carrying. I know the other teams have injuries that they're carrying, but I think they're in a better position for having the week off compared to the other teams that have to play another grand final and another grand final before the grand final Yep. for me. So, oh, yeah, it's yeah, clear days. Clear days that those two will be, for me, the final. Do you think it's like a one-off thing this year? Or, or, like, obviously the Panthers have been going back-to-back -back every season to the finals. Is it just going to be this year because of the injuries and next year it might be more competitive again, like in... Uh, previous years or is that just a trend now in the NRL that there are teams that are just better and everyone else is uh, I, I would have loved to see the Roosters at full strength because I don't think we've seen the best defensive Roosters team we've seen a really good attacking team but I would have loved to see them have all their players available fit healthy Sam Walker on the field Hardgreaves in there playing uh, Victor Radley on the field their best 17 playing in the finals football. You don't, we're not getting that this year. So I think, and, and this is the last chance that they're going to get this this opportunity to be able to play with those those players as well. So I would love to see them. Unfortunately, this is the game of rugby league that you don't always have your best players on the field and you still got to wake up, or we've still got to get a job done with what you have. Um, so I just think, you know, the other teams besides the Cowboys have all their full 17. So they may be the team that's going to shake it up, but I still think that, you know, after playing all those amount of big game moments or games, that it's still going to be hard for those teams. I'm not sure if it's an anomaly this year. As I said, it was the same last year. Uh, the, the two top teams, the Broncos and the Panthers last year, were clear-cut favourites and way ahead of the rest of the pack. Uh, next year could be different. And that's down to recruitment and coaching and fitness of mm. and health of teams as they come into this time of year. That's what's affected the Roosters. But what they have is everyone across the park, and I'm talking about the Panthers mm. and Manly, uh, Melbourne, they have everyone across the park just doing their jobs exceptionally well. They are outstanding from 1 to 17. Whoever's out there knows their job and they do it to the highest intensity possible. And they're doing it for longer than oppositions. What some of the oppositions have, however, is some good individuals, some quality individuals. I'm not sure if across the park they're up to that level that those two teams are after. Mm. That's the challenge going into next season. Um, moving on to the next game, Cowboys versus Knights at Queensland Country Bank, 28-16 to the Cowboys. Your guys' predictions, both were with the Cowboys. Uh, Adam, you said 38-12 <laughs> with Tom Dearden as man of the match. Willie, you said Cowboys by four with Scott Drinkwater 
uh, his man of the match. Obviously, it came down to towards the end of the game with those two big mm. tries by Dearden and uh, also Cotter. Yeah. Um, and just with what you guys were saying before uh, about the two clear favorites, out of the four teams that are left now, I yeah. actually think the Cowboys yeah. might be the best team yeah. at this stage with the injuries to the Roosters yeah. and the inconsistency of the Sharks. And I think if it isn't to be one of my Panthers or the Storm to win the premiership, I think the Cowboys are third up in that off the back of this performance as well. Yeah, it was it was an exciting game. Exciting game. I thought the Knights created opportunities. They had some moments, but just couldn't get it in the end, really. Uh, so I, I definitely thought they put the Cowboys under pressure. And and I said it when I when I picked the Cowboys that it will be hard for the Knights to go up to Townsville off the back of their last performance in front of a sold out crowd at this time of the year with the humidity and the heat. Uh, and to try and knock off these guys. and uh, But I thought they put in a really good shift and they should be proud of their last game. But in saying that, there was moments that I thought if they just executed that, the pressure would have been put on the Cowboys to try and come home strong. And I think the pass to Dane Gagai, I think that kind of kind of was the moment. You know, they, they had a little bit of momentum and they're rolling down, they're scoring some tries and then that pass there, if that was executed, if he had his time over again, whether it was too low or, or whether he should have caught it or not, if he had his time again and he executed that pass, that could have been the moment for the Knights. Obviously, it's not. But like you said, I think the Cowboys, and I just said it before, could give one of those teams a shake with keep being able to have their full strength players on the field. I think Helam Luke is playing well. Man, he's been strong the last three weeks for the Cowboys. Dead and you know, drink water. Those guys um, are doing a really good job with the with the Cowboys and where they're going. They they got lucky, I reckon, if they caught a try. Like they could have, you could have given the evidence that you couldn't really see much. He goes up for a no, a, a no try, and you they, you could have gone. There was inconclusive evidence, but they went for the try, and kind of that's where it all went through. Leo Thompson gets Sinbin. I think, what was it, six minutes to go or just six minutes to go when the game was kind of still there to be taken. Gets wrong foot, it comes out of the line trying to make a statement, wrong foot him, swinging arm, hits him high and goes to the bin. And I think from there, it was too hard for the Knights to try and put themselves back in it. Obviously at the end, Dearden scores that try. Typical Dearden, the way he ran that ball, just found finds the space, ducks under, gets in there and scores a nice easy try to finish off. So... They'll be happy with their performance, I think, the Cowboys. Like, there's some things they would want to tidy up defensively. But all in all, like you said and like I said, I think they're a chance of, you know, going past next this week and then getting a chance to play one of the big dogs. Yeah, I thought uh, the intensity of the match was set right from the start. I thought they played really, really strong the Knights. So they carried strong. I think it was the third tackle of the game. Greg Marju bumps off Jason Tomalolo and just sat him down. And you never see that. You never see that. And thought, oh, we're in for a match here. Mm. We're in for a game. And the Cowboys returned serve with some strong carries. And Tomalolo got his own back a little bit later yeah. with a great shot, I think, on Leo Thompson. Mm. Uh, he's, uh, he's returned to some of his best, Jason, and I'm real happy for him. I'm mm. happy for the Cowboys. And it's no coincidence that they are starting to play well when he starts to play well. Such is the importance to him. But I don't think there was anything more Caelan Ponga could have done. Oh, no, brother, he was everywhere. For, for the Knights, I thought he was the best on the park mm -hmm. individually. Oh. Uh, just amazing some of the runs that he's able to make and some of his footwork. Oh, oh my God. Just Viliami Vailea put him on skates. Oh, well, just before um, Felt and got the intercepted yeah. and went the distance. Mm. Um, footwork, just right footstep, boom, broke his ankles, pass and play. He's got the balance, he's got the strength, he runs that hard. That it's so hard to tackle him. And I, I thought he's one that left the field and left everything out there for the season. And hopefully he can do that throughout the course of the season. It's taken him a little while to get going, Kalen Ponga, but he'll be proud of how he's played in this game. And the Cowboys, they move on to the next one. And as you said... Because they've won, as I was saying before, because they've won, they've got the confidence. They've got all that confidence of knowing that they can come from behind when needed. If they get a lead, they, they've just got to try and hold on to it. But be disappointed with some of the D. Mm. Be disappointed with some of the D and how Ponga was able to split them a couple of times. But 
Yeah, the Knights will be ruining that drop ball from Dan Gagai. That was the moment. That was the moment to seal it. The line was wide open. Yeah. It wasn't the best pass no. from Ponga, but it was more than catchable for Dan Gagai just to take it, reach out in front and go. I don't know if he was thinking about scoring the mm. try first before he had caught the ball, which can be a thing, but, yeah, one one to think about over the course of preseason. This is the heartbreaking thing about losing now in the playoffs is during the season, you come back in, Monday you review, Tuesday you're back on to the next game. Mm. You forget about what's happened there. Now you've got the whole preseason to think about that one moment mm. and what could have been. But, yeah, good luck to the Cowboys. They move forward and deservedly so. Yeah, man, I, I, I love Callum Ponga as a player. Um, got to play with him in the Māori's 2019, I think, and, man, he is tough. Uh, for a smaller defender. And you've seen some of his his origin highlights anyway, you know what I mean? Like he puts his body on the line and then in attack, the ball skills, the footwork, he has everything. He's hard to tackle. So I think he's, you know, if you can get him like that every single week with the support of others around him to actually give him the space because he can't do what he does without the forwards going forward and the halves creating the momentum or giving him the space to be able to play football. And he can go down short sides and create that stuff on opportunities because he can see, I guess, a, a lesser number. But on the back of the momentum, his play on that two-pass wide shift, man, he is so hard to handle. It's crazy. Like, such a tough player. Such a tough player. The good players, they can think a play or two ahead. You know, they're ahead of the game. That's what they say. They Good players read the game. They know what's coming. But he can break it down to being seconds ahead. So that time when he beat Vilea, he knew the ball was here. He knew where he was going to be mm. two seconds before. And he knew that if if he comes to me, just I catch the ball. Whilst the ball's still in the air, step and I'm here. And he knew that straight away. That's the class and the quality of the man. I think the duty is on the Knights to really make sure they can build around him, eh? Because he, obviously, Dally in last year and mm. all these things that he can do on a field is one of the best players in the NRL. The, the Knights, surely with a player like that, could be pushing to the end of the finals. But obviously, in these last two seasons, even with him at his best, they haven't quite been able to do it, at maybe in... As yeah, a whole team together. Well, they 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 moved their nine Phoenix Crossland to the halves, and Mushri found a little bit more space for Caden on the back of that movement. So I think, but that's been I think their season eh, is they they're mix and matching through their halves and trying to find what works. Hasting didn't work, uh, and then they've moved Cogger and then Phoenix in there and. They've had so much movement around there trying to fit, I think, to help Kalen. Eh? They've been trying to find a style to help Kalen. I think Phoenix, obviously, from hooker squaring up, being able to play square and straight, allows Kalen to do what he does. But you're using a nine as your seven. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking you're you're losing something. I know they got Braley, and I know he's a good nine as well. But so is Phoenix Crossland. So they got some work to do in the offseason around their spine. And where they look to and how they're going to be able to free up Kalen Pong. And like we've said, like he needs help. Like you can't just allow him to try and be the match winner. You want him to execute those moments like that pass to, to Dane Gagai. And every time he gets into those moments, you want to be, he wants to execute him nine times out of 10 or 10 times out of 10 so that he can actually be that person, but not doing everything to try and drag those boys over the line because he yeah. tried his butt out and unfortunately just not good enough in the end. I've heard um, Braley and is one of the guys who yeah. might be on the out yeah. uh, this off season along with um, they're talking about so. Braley and Jackson Hastings yeah. possibly Jackson not Hastings. being moved on. Yeah, so. there's a few people being tapped on the shoulder. Eh? I think I'm guessing they're trying to find maybe a half that's and maybe an older one. I don't know because I think that's the hardest thing at the moment is there is no older halves getting around in the game. I think in a couple of years time there may be some younger ones coming off, but even then like. The spine, the halves these days are quite young, um, unless you try and jag a Jerome Hughes or something like that, which I never think they'll leave Melbourne Storm, but you know what I mean? So it, it's a tough space in the halves space, on that spine space. There's plenty of fullbacks, plenty of fullbacks in the game, uh, uh, but not too many experienced halves. And if anybody can find them, you'd expect Peter, Peter O'Sullivan to be someone who could find someone. Mm. He's coming as the recruitment manager halfway through the season from the Dolphins, and already shaking things up. 
told the likes of Safiti and a couple of others that they're going to be moved on and looking at changing the roster. And sometimes that's for playing ability or for what the coach wants. And sometimes mm. that's for salary cap salary, purposes. Yeah. So there's multiple reasons, but you can do, you can put it down to that. He'll find someone out there if there is anybody. Mm. Um, I'm going to be like a broken record with this one because <laughs> I talk about him every week of like the past month. But Carl felt wow. 12 tries in his past seven games. <laughs> For some reason, he's just decided, man, I'm leaving. You know what? I'm just yeah. going to absolutely leave everything in these games. And the try scored in this game, electrify, obviously. Yeah. The he's, he's obviously not as fast as he used to be, but he's running as hard as he can, getting chased down by Cogger. I thought that was quite a good moment. Yeah, he's. I think he's a, is a, is a big moment player. You know what I mean? Like grand final 2015 scores the winning try like in this game just puts himself in the right position like he's safe you know what i mean like high balls come catches the ball brings the ball back like he puts himself in the position that when they're in these when they're in those big moments of big games makes it happen and that was a moment yes like he had a fair bit to do and yes he doesn't have the speed but You've got to know and understand the game and players to put yourself in the moments that he puts himself in nine times out of ten. And man, he's he's leaving the game and going on a high, I reckon. For everything that he's done over the last, I guess, his time for the Cowboys has been immense. And it's only solidifying himself as one of those kind of wingers that just will go to the UK and perform, I think, and be a great pickup. A great pickup. Yeah, he's just enhancing his legend, isn't he? as a Cowboys player to all the Cowboys fans. And when he got that intercept and I saw how far away it was, I was like, all right, old man, how long have, yeah. have you got it still in you? And sure enough, he did. He did. And it's great to see, great for the fans. You could see them all standing up, just riding him home and, and he got it done. So uh, hopefully he's got a couple more for the Cowboys fans in him before he goes. Next year, Super League game of the round will be uh, when... <coughs> and Raps uh, matched up against each hey, other. Oh, that will be awesome. Uh, last one for this game, Leo Thompson uh, actually received a one-to-two match ban uh, for his yeah. high tackle. That's taken him, him out of New Zealand, presumably. Oh, uh, yeah, well, he'll yeah. take the one, you'd think, not the two. So you take the, the early or the guilty and take the one week. Um, you pick a squad of, what is it, 21, and I think in the end, and... Like, I think he's still being a part of that. You miss one game and then you're still around for hopefully the second one or the second and the third if they get to the final. So he's a big part of the Kiwi space. Um, he is that next generation of front rowers on the back of, you know, what Fisher Harris is creating. And I said it to a lot of people, really reminds me of James when he first come into that international space around the work ethic, training, mentality. He's not at James's level yet, but he is growing as a front row, and I think he's got a bright future. So I still think, you know, I haven't spoken to Stace, but I still think he'll be a chance of being in that squad anyway. He seems like a character. He, he's he's dedicated. Yeah, you know, he's he knows what he wants. He's dedicated to it. Driven. His, yeah, he's driven. He's motivated. He wants to be the best player. And those guys you want to work with. Those yeah. guys you can guide. You know what I mean? Like. Although he may have a switch like we saw in that game where he's like, I'm coming out, I'm going to make a moment here. He got it wrong. He got it wrong. You know, let's be, let's be honest. He got it wrong, but he has a switch where he can just go from being real dedicated and, and to like trying to change something. You yeah. know? And you, you like those those players you want to work with, those players you can you can teach, those players can learn, you know. Yeah. And he's young. He's, what's he, this is his second year of full-time like NRL and... You know, he's, his first year he's played Kiwis. He'll be a big part of the, the journey going to World yeah. Cup, you know what I mean? And you may lose a couple of older front rowers at times or someone may get injured. He is your next front rower up. So he's uh, um, he's got a switch old Leo. <laughs> Even the, the cultural and leadership. He is I was huge. watching the Australia huge. games from last season and he was there leading the Huckers. Yep, <laughs> and that's a big part of what Leo does as well, alongside Fish. You know, when you talk about culture, um, those two guys are so driven around it and want to be, I guess, role models for our next front rowers or our Māori kids. And there's no better two people to represent, um, you know, Māori as in, being proud and standing up tall and speaking 
and encouraging and, and being in a, an Australasian competition and displaying their culture on the world stage. Like those two guys, man, I put them together and I'm just like, whoa, <laughs> like they are the two scariest fellas. When you stand in the haka, you know, I thought Isaac Luke was scary, but you got these two big monsters. <laughs> oh, brother. Like imagine those two and then Isaac Luke in the middle, how big Isaac Luke would look. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they are beasts, man. And yeah, culture is the, the utmost first thing for those two guys. And, you know, that's why they're so important to not only, you know, New Zealand rugby league, but Māori rugby league as well. Last game of the finals round one was probably the game of the round. Bulldogs versus Sea Eagles at a core 24 to 22 to the Sea Eagles. Predictions were, Adam, you did pick correctly, Sea Eagles, 24 to 16 with Cherry Evans as man of the match. And Willie, and I, I made a point to stick with you on this one because of how bad of an omen I had been for them. Bulldogs to win in Golden Point with wow. Matt Burden as a field goal Bruv. winner. Brav. He had two chances to tie it up. One of them was going over and it just dipped under. But congratulations to the Seagulls on winning the, that very intense game. Yeah, it was um, it was a nail butter, I thought. I thought um, played in really good spirits, high quality brand of football, rugby league um, at its best. And, you know, when you go through both sides, I thought all their key players stood up at some moments of the game. And, you know, you talk about that golden point and I think I was thinking back to our, our show and thinking about this moment and I think what happened was I it was not too long to go in that last bit of that first, uh, the last end of the game and I think Burden takes a run, makes all these metres, gets tackled, they go one in and then I think he just forgets about the moment that he was in and where the time was on the clock because I see Reed Marnie pointing him to do the, 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 the two point and try and kick that field goal. And then goes to the front row of the front or kick out or something and then passes it back to Burden. And Burden just taps the ball. And if he had his time again, I think if he put himself in a better position, he hits that, he hits that nine times out of ten. Like he hits that drop kick. He gets it just short or just right of the post. But I think, you know, big games come up with big moments. And that was mostly the moment that he missed. Um, only because I thought. He saw the space he ran because it was like it was like a quick play of the ball and he just didn't he I think he forgot about the time and place of where they were on the field, but also the timing of where the game was ending and could have gone into a golden point and I reckon he would have been a big chance of being the winner like you guys predicted. But you know, you gotta give credit to the Seagulls. Uh, some of the older heads stood up. I thought Travojevic, Turbo it, it was a slow he looked sore. He looked sore, his shoulder looked sore, he carried it didn't really look like he had it too much intent in his runs. You go into the second half, and I heard the commentators talking about it. Like, he obviously got a needle. He come out, he opened up the field, he started playing a bit of football, and, you know, they, they come home really strong. I thought, Leo Hopawadi, man, welcome to first grade, brother. <laughs> like, they ragdolled him every time he carried the ball. Um, but the intensity of the defensive line, as in we spoke about Liam Martin's kick chasing and some of these back rowers being able to compete, uh, Viliami Kika, who has done that all year, put pressure on every on him every time he carried the ball. They picked him up. They dragged him into the end goal. Um, the kid's only 19. I reckon he's, what's he weighing? 82 kilos. And you're up against a 100 and I reckon 7 kilo back rower that just knows how strong he is and just rags those him every time he carried the ball. But he'll learn his lessons because every time he carried the ball, I was like, bro, just, just use your feet, get down to the ground as quick as you can because these guys are going to pick you up. He gets taken out once. I think Crichton flips him over. Kikau drags him back into the end goal. So there'll be some really good lessons for Leo Hopuati and in, in, uh, moving forward into his career where he has to put a little bit more size on, uh, where he has to just be a little bit smarter with his options as in being so young, you want to try and take on everyone, but being smart in the game of rugby league, I thought he'd done a really good job other than that. Cola, right, what a try to finish off with, you know what I mean? I thought Ben Chavojevic could have done a better job of squaring up the half and then playing him into space, but backs his speed, gave him the ball and had a work to do. He had to get through three players there and found some space, scored that try, and that was kind of the icing on the cake for, for the Seagulls. But, mate, they had to do it tough because Bulldogs turned up defensively and went after them. Yeah, the, the try you're talking about with uh, <coughs> Cola. Excuse me. There's some similarities to that in the same corner that Kickout scored. His great try, oh. individual effort, big man turning people inside out, falling over, defenders off, 
and just storms in for another try. And I thought he was exceptional for the dogs. And I thought they were the better side throughout the contest. Now the the turning point for me was the mentality of the Manly side switched when Josh Curran went and started pushing and shoving. Mm. And then uh, Cherry Cherry flipped Evans them. flipped them onto the ground. There was no need for him to come in. No. There was no need for him to poke the bear. It was a little bit of a push and shove to start with. Then he comes from nowhere and pushes Garrick. Cherry Evans throws him on the ground. Uh, I thought Manly just got their hump on and just thought, all right, we're going to play like this. Well, Reed Marnie comes swinging in with a swinging arm on Garrick. And I thought, oh, man, that's a penalty. They said play on. But the thing that Garrick did is stood there. Gave him a little shove. Reed Money tried to carry on, and that's when Joshy Curran comes straight in. And it's like, brother. Like, uh, and I think the referee had just been those two. Yes. Play on. Yes. Just stay. go back, yep. play the ball, and play yep. on. Manly get the penalty. Yeah. As I said, their mindset changed. Yeah. And they just put him to the sword after. And it wasn't too long after that, Collar mm. scored that try. Mm. So that's a moment I think the dogs will, as I'm talking about, throughout the course of preseason, I think if I had that moment again, mm. Probably do that a little bit differently, Josh mm. Curran. But it's been a season of growth, mm. definitely for the dogs to come into a playoff game after being out for so long and have the favourites tag coming into the game. Says how much they've come on as a group. Their challenge now is to be in that position again next year, yeah. um, be consistent again throughout 2000, 2025 and get to that again. Manly. Because of what they've got in their armory, Trebojevic, if his shoulder's all right, Cherry Evans, I thought in his first playoff game, Luke Brooks was great. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And so happy for him too, Willie. Real happy. Far out. Real happy for the kid, you know, to play so long and be in his first ever playoff game. To survive that with a win, get to go it's again next. Two. I thought the one of the best, though, was Olokayatu. Oh, oh, beast. The, the beast has Which, just come alive the last couple of weeks. New Zealand. And those guys? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll take you, bro. We'll take you, please. I know. Uh, yeah, I know. You, you want to play for Tonga. Are you part okay. Samoa? It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll take it, mate. Either way, Samoa or yeah, New Zealand. But I think with those guys and how they're firing, you know, they could take them deep. Mm. They could take them deep. And a great win for uh, Anthony Seabold and his team. But... Yeah, tough for Cameron Serraldo, but he's done a great job with the side that he's had out. Yeah, that battle between uh, Kikau and Olukuatu, man, the whole time I was watching, I was just loving it. And stuff like even the charge down from Kikau, yeah. he's like the only dude that can do it, obviously, earlier. Yeah, well, it, it's a yeah. risky play, bro. It is a risky play because if you don't get the ball back like that and you've just defended your butts off to try and keep him in the space, sometimes... You know, in hindsight, if he goes long, your fullback catches, he brings it back, you're on, or you're already on your 40 metre, blah, blah, blah. But I just think in those moments, because he's done it so consistently this year, if you get the bounce of the ball, it falls into his hand, he scores a try. Yeah. So it's a 50-50, 50-50 play. Some coaches like it, some coaches don't. And especially on the last players, if you're going to risk it, you're going to have to turn up defensively. But I think they've built their season around turning up for each other. But I think there were so many moments through that game where it was push and shove, it was yeah. Yeah, fiery, it was, you know, Josh Curran coming in there, Stephen Crichton arcing up, you know, Reed Moaning, who was always yarking up anyway, comes in with swinging arms. So it was a bit of one of those games, I thought, anyway. They knew how much was on the line. And I think I think the Bulldogs try to play that way where they wanted to try and bully the opposition. And I think after playing them two weeks ago, I think, and Manly gave them a bit of a tell-up, Manly tried to play that same blueprint where they bullied them through the middle of the park with Matt Lodge and Paseca, but the Bulldogs were up for the battle, and you could see that they were trying to compete and push and shove and do all those things to put them off their game, but the experience of some of those older players in the back end of their game, it goes to show, show that playing at big, like big footy games or big moments that those guys stand up and, like you said, all look hard to... Ooh, you can see every time he was getting at the half, Burton, that William Kikau would just come flying in and just go put his body in to get stuck into him because they knew how damaging it was. And there was a run there where he gets through them, falls on the ground, gets back up, falls on the ground, loses the ball. But there's there's some he had some special moments in the game. He's a tough player. Also can compete in there like Ali Katoa. So you, you imagine that Tongan team. <laughs> Ali Katoa and him on the edges. Like they are some of the two best back rowers going around when it comes to size, power, 
and athleticism in the game. Yep. It's and crazy. They, and they have Keon as well. Keon Matangi. <laughs> like, he's going to play lock. <laughs> well, he was the best lock for yeah. the, 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 the um, Rabbitohs when he was playing. His stats, 200, averaging 200 metres, you know what I mean? Like, you put those three there, <laughs> wow, they have got some forwards. Just a question for you. How much of a distraction and how much do you think they've missed at Okar? Yeah, it's a distraction. And you can always say that it's not a distraction and it's footy. And But I do think when you're, you're such a, a group where they've built this culture on togetherness and, you know, the dogs of war and bringing back all these old boys and creating the fan base to bring them all back together, he becomes one of those, one of those important players for your team. And... Uh, when all that stuff comes out, you're just thinking like, why? You know, why Why on the eve of your first finals football in so many years that you want to put yourself in a situation that's going to affect not only yourself but affect the club and the players around you because you become close mates. And that's the important thing when you're playing a team sport is that not only your on-field performances, you got to build a relationship and a connection, but off the field is just as important, like hanging out with each other. Yep. And then someone separates themselves from the group because of an incident, then everyone's going, well, where's where's our um, where's our energy bunny? Where's our guy that carries the music? You know, and then you're asking someone else to do that job, which doesn't necessarily do it. So yeah. I feel like, yes, it's a distraction. And man, if he had his time over again, I think he thinks twice. I like a lot of people they put themselves in some bad situations. That if you have your time again on the eve of what's just been like one of the best years they've had in a long time to where they're building to, to how they're going to be going in this final series. Like he plays a big part in the Bulldogs uh, performances. His speed, you can't, you can't coach speed. You mm. can't do what he does. You can't coach his energy that he brings to the team. You can't, can't coach the enthusiasm that he creates around the group. So it definitely was a distraction, 100%. Um, so next week, obviously, we've got the two games on uh, the Sharks versus the Cowboys and the Roosters versus the Seagulls. I believe they're both at Allianz Arena uh, Stadium. Sorry. So we'll get the predictions in from you guys for these ones as well. Sharks versus Cowboys. What is the score line and who's going to be? Um, I'm going to say Cowboys. Stay strong with Cowboys. I think they'll win. 24-12, and again, I'm staying strong to Dearden. I think he's been enormous. I think he even gets his, his Aussie Aussie team because he's so good. I'm going Cowboys 18-14. And Val Holmes. Oosh. In the, one of his last games for the club, he's going to be the... Uh, any drop goals or anything like that in this one? No, not in this one. Okay. Roosters. <coughs> Unless the Cowboys get 18 of them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, never know. Two pointers, you know. But they can um, Roosters versus Seagulls. Yeah, I just think the Seagulls are going to be uh, have too much experience in the end for uh, a bit of a bashed up Roosters team that just didn't perform well against the Penrith Panthers. I just don't think. They're going to lose. They lose a lot of their key players. Obviously, they get Jared back, which will be nice for their middle of the pack, um, which will bring some starch when you come up against the two front rowers from you know Matt Lodge, Paseka, Lokoatu as well. And part of that, you come up against those guys, you're going to need your best fronties on the field, and they're going to be expecting a big game. But I just think the experience of Cherry Evans, Tom Trevojevic, hopefully he's fit, which he will be. This is do or die. So chuck a needle in there, you'll be good. Uh, we'll get this game, and I think they win by a. I might shoot, just go on a little bit. I reckon they win by, I reckon 34, 34 12. I think they put Damn. a score on them. That'd be a rough way for the Roosters to go out for sure. Mm. Willie? I'm going the Roosters by 16 to Disco, man of the match. Holy opposite sides of the spectrum for you guys on that one. Well, you got to got to be different at some point. Oh. You can't just go at the same thing, can you? Well, it's true. The two ones that you guys split on, you each got one right. <laughs> the Bulldogs. This might I be mean, it, yeah. The Seagulls is correct. And then the, the, not the Cowboys. Yeah, the Cowboys. What was the first one? No, the, the Knights. It was a, oh, the, Roosters, Roosters, the Roosters Panthers game. Uh, and then before we go, <clears> I, <throat> I got together a little bit of a 
thing for us to do. Uh, yeah. Pick out our team of the year before the Dally M team of the year comes out. But I thought, man, it's pretty boring to just pick all of the best players and, you know, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. don't want, you know, eight Storm players and seven Panthers players yeah. in the team. So the caveat of this is going to be only one selection per NRL club is allowed. Yeah. In the team, and with that, we'll start off by selecting the spine <laughs> players. So the one, six, seven, and nine. Who are your guys' picks for those in and around those positions? I've got Tedesco at fullback. Tedesco. At fullback. What? What? All my spine? Uh, one for one. one, for one. No, okay. I'm, I'm going to say Callum Ponga. Ponga. Oh, that is interesting. Okay, so either of you guys want to cave on your opinions or if you don't want to cave then i'll just be the tiebreaker i i can i i'm just saying because because we have to pick one from oh, well, as many as we can from one team and i think sometimes when i like i would i was thinking maybe tom travoyovich but i really wanted to pick someone else from the manly seagull so you kind of got to try and match and pick and match other teams and players on who you want to go and i think Callum pong has had you know, he, he's a quality fullback. I, I like what Kalen Ponga, Ponga, Ponga brings. I think if you look at other fullbacks in the competition, like Tedesco, it could be someone might like Reese Walsh, someone like me, someone else. So Ponga for me is my best fullback for my team. My team. Yeah, I just I went straight back to Vegas and he was great throughout the course of the season for me, Tedesco. He's had one of his best seasons for a long time. and I think he's been consistent every single week throughout the course of the year. Um, there was a moment there where there were some arguments through Origin that Dylan Edwards was why, far, by far better than him and he got his chance through Dylan Edwards getting injured. But I think he's jumped him just because he's been playing and Dylan Edwards was injured for a while. And he is the second behind Jerome Hughes in the Dally M, or at least we assume. But man, there's definitely some... There's one other guy in the Roosters who I think maybe deserves it even more than Tedesco to be in the team there. So I'm going to go with Adam on this one and pick uh, Ponga as the one. for. At, <laughs> That's my first win. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. For <laughs> at number six, uh, who have you guys got? I've got Jerome Aluai from the Panthers. <laughs> Adam? Um. Again, you know, we have, you have to think about who you who other positions you want from the club. I've gone, I know he got injured in his last game. I've gone, someone from Parramatta, I've gone for the Kiwi Six. Obviously, he's injured, but it's uh, Dylan Brown. Okay, uh, give me your give me your reasons for your picks. Why should I pick? Because obviously, I'm wearing the jersey. Well, a bit like what Blairy was saying, there's some other players that you could pick from the Panthers. <laughs> but I had to try and argue with myself about if there were any contenders for those positions. And there were there were some contenders for the other position. Not many contenders for the six for me with Luai. Mm. So he was the standout. Yes, yeah, so I'm quite similar, obviously, but I wanted someone else from the Penrith Panthers, hence why I didn't go for Jerome Luai. I think he's a really good six. I re that definitely he's had one of his better years in that sixth position, I just wanted someone else that is a better player than him in his position, that's all. In another position of in that Panthers team. Oh, see, it could be anyone from the Panthers. I'm trying to think of he, who you're <laughs> even referring to, and I don't even know because there's like eight other people that it could be. <laughs> um, and maybe just for that, I might just go with you on Dylan Brown as well, just to leave the Panthers spot open for someone else. <laughs> 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 I'll yeah, take another I, I, one. Just for this one, yeah, I will go with uh, Bill Brown uh, as the six. The seven, I have a feeling this is going to be pretty easy of one for you guys. Hughes. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. Yeah, we don't need to chat about that one too much. He's going to be the Dally M. Uh, and then last spine player, the nine. Who have you guys Reese Robson. Okay. Robson? He's my Cowboys representative. I've got um, June Marshall King. Uh, the reasons more so for the same thing as what we always said is that we're trying. I'm trying to move someone else around, and I have someone else from 
the Cowboys that I want to use. I do love Reese Robson and what he can bring. He's an origin player. He's solid. He's playing finals football. So I really wanted to bring some creativity around the middle of my park with some of the guys that I've picked as well. Um, also a really good defender. Uh, obviously didn't play too much in this back and got injured. But you can see the difference when um, Jerry Marshall King is playing around the movement and the way that he can bring his forwards onto the ball. Um, and a tough Kiwi player as well. So I went with Jerry Marshall King. I think on this one I'm going with Willie. The first half of the season, Robson uh, was, I think, clearly the... Oh, maybe apart from Jerry Marshall King, he was clearly the best hooker, got selected for... You may have said Wade Egan as well. He was in contention yeah, true, for... Yeah, true, true. Wade Egan you know? as well. Um, but then even in, in the Origin games, Beast. when the Blues won, there was that one tackle he made, yep. uh, I think, in Origin 3. That was just incredible. And, yeah, I'm going to go with... There you go, Willie. The brother, Robs. <laughs> we're back, we're back. You're back, you got the one. <laughs> um, and then why don't we move, obviously, you guys prefer middles, you know, outside backs, it's not, you know, exciting for you guys. So we'll go on to uh, the forward pack next. So the eight, the 10, and the 13, I guess. So we'll do front rowers first. Who you guys got as your props? I've got um, AFB. AFB. I think the best you know, front row in the competition when it comes to what he can deliver for a team. Um, I think he's number one in post-contact metres. So he's, you know, he's a quality front rower and is, you know, he averages 160, 70 metres per game for a, a big body. You know what I mean? Like he attracts defenders, got ball players, got great feet. And, um, you know, it's for a front rower to be able to have that many post-contact metres, it's Big volumes of the players. You'll go close to winning that um, Delhi in front row of the year. I've gone for his teammate and player of the year for the Warriors, Mitch Barnett. I think he's been outstanding with his leadership. It was great in, in origin. So I've gone Barnett. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised. Like, I know I, both, I'm both a big Warriors fan. Of, <laughs> but, hey, we split here. Uh, take the starting front row. I think the one that has to be just for his whole impact on the whole club of the Warriors during their struggles I think it has to be Barnett for that one um, sorry Adam and then for the other prop who? I've got Payne Haas for his impact going throughout the season but especially in Origin when there were question marks about how impactful he can be at that level and I thought he really imposed himself at Origin on you know this year, I know he's been injured the last couple of weeks, but I just think he's exceptional as a front rower. He's changed the landscape of what a front rower is for that size and how long they play and how what their output is on a on a match. I've I've gone for Joseph uh, Tapani. I think um, you know alongside Adam. You know, his post-contact meet is, is second in the competition. Uh, so, yeah, I've got one and two as my two front rowers. And he's been consistent over a long time. Like, these guys that are playing, Adam, that I spoke about, and Joseph that I'm talking about now, these guys have been at their elite level of front rowers in the competition for a long time. And uh, what he does up at, at Canberra and what he does, obviously, in the international space is, is enormous and... Um, post-context metres is, is important in, in this competition and you put them alongside Reese Robson uh, or even Jerry Marshall Kings, they don't look like they're out of place, but those two together, whew, huge. I actually like that pick. I think I would agree with you on that one, Adam. Just, you know, Payne Haas obviously gets all of the credit all of the time from everyone because he is that good and I do love him, but he was injured for a bit of the season. The Broncos had a terrible season. Uh, Raiders... Also, didn't have the best season, but um, I think, yeah, Joe Tarpanier, the skull boy. And then 13. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm going for the man himself, bro, from South Sydney, Cam Murray. I think, man, this kid can play some footy. Like, he's an origin player, he's a test match player. He was the best player for South this year in some tough times and... Man, I think there was moments there through those some of those stats when we spoke about him through our, our on our show here. I think it was over like a hundred and something meters, thirty something tackles every single game, and hence why he bloody had to have a rest. 
on the sideline. So I've gone Cam Murray just because he's the man. And I have two. Cam Murray. Oh, the second one that you guys have actually agreed on. <laughs> uh, and then I guess we'll do the back rowers <clears throat> next, 12, uh, 11 and 12. I've gone the man that killed it yesterday, Haumole Lokeatu. I think he's been wonderful this year. Again, quiet to start with. He signed a big contract and his question marks, was he living up to that value? But at the right time, you know, he's doing it. And I don't think they used him well enough in origin. I think it's, he can still mm. impose himself and be dangerous for the Blues going forward if they learn how to use him right. And Anthony Seabold knows how to use him and getting the best out of him. I think he's one of my picks. Yeah, I think we're going to both be some of the numbers on the sideline don't don't matter what position, what side of the field they play on. So um, I've gone Hamoli as well, just bro. And I said it previously on the show, I'd love him to play for New Zealand, but not going to happen. But man, <coughs> that guy is a beast. And then the other one? Um, I've gone Britain. Most probably the best rower, best back rower in the competition this year. Just the way, what he can do with the ball. Uh, the lines he runs, like, those lines that he runs are typical back row lines. He may not be as big and physical and strong as Homoli, but you have them on your side and both edges. Like, you know what you're going to get from Homoli, you know what you're going to get from Britain. And, mate, like, there's no way that they are both intimidating back rows as well. Nakora? Okay, that kind of throws why I um, picked a, agreed with Adam on Ponga because I was going to say that the guy that I thought to put in would be uh, Angus Crichton. So I actually, well, since neither of you guys picked him, I might retrospectively go back and switch Ponga for to this. You can't do that, bro. Yeah, you've already, so you've already picked it. Unlucky else. I gambled it and it didn't pay off. Oh. No, I'm, I'm being the mediator so that we can make sure we get uh, a, a, a full team together. Well, no, I'm, picking between... I'm actually smashing this if I tell you that much. Like, <laughs> between Willie and I and you, like I'm actually my players are all over this team. I may not have two picks right now, but far out. Okay, to come down to these ones though. <laughs> wow, we could have some different opinions here. There's uh, four places left: the outside backs and <laughs> the teams that are left. There's three of them that are finals teams: the Panthers, the Roosters, and the Bulldogs. Just bearing in mind, in case you guys wanted to change any of your picks. Hey, just quickly, just because the Dolphins aren't up there now, can I, if I've got someone else, can I put them in? Because you didn't pick my guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, we'll start with, uh, let's do the two centres first. Dolphins. <laughs> uh, Farnworth. Farnworth. I think that is that the guy that you're referring to for Dolphins. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, that, but I'll stay with my pick. I'll stay with my pick. I, I went Valentine Holmes. I'll stay with my pick just because, you know, there's no point trying to copy Willie. Um, but that was what I was trying to, you know, <laughs> talk about. But I think Valentine Holmes. I think when you look at a team and what he's been able to do, I think he's been quality, especially since I think he let a lot of the outside stuff go. I think he's 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 a goal kicker. Again, he's the, the the most point scorer in the you know point scored in the season, and um, along with another guy of ours as well that I think will be in our our winger position. But you, you need guys like him in your team. I find worth I think is an exceptional center as well. So whichever way you go, my bro, it doesn't really. Matter. I am going to copy Willie and do yeah. do find with even it out. And then the other center, I can only assume will be Bulldogs. Yeah, yeah, and we both got the bow critter. And then what is left is the two wingers, two and five. Who you guys got for those? I've got Lomax and Cam Pereira. But I know Blairy's got someone else. <laughs> We've been waiting this all day. So I've, I've got, obviously, we got to stick to uh, Cam Pereira. I think, you know, top try score, man. What a beast. Uh, you can't substitute that for any speed. And then my Panthers pick, this is where my Panthers pick comes in. It's Brian Tall, the best winger in the competition, brother. You cannot. <laughs> you know, this guy can play some footy. He is like a, a front row on your field. And I think he's behind behind Joseph Tarpane. So it goes Ed and Joseph Tarpane and Brian Tall when it comes to post-contact meters. And you think about those three big bodies and the size of 
Brian, like he is the best winger. I think he wins that at Dalian as well. Dalian winger of the year. I think we can't be making a team of the year without having a Panthan because I didn't pick Lua <laughs> uh, when you suggested him. We'll just have to yeah. put Tall in. It's not, of course, he's the best winger in the NRL, so not too shabby of a pick. So I'll read out what we've got here, and you guys let me know if there's we need to make any last minute changes to this team. So we got uh, Ponga, Campereta, Farnworth, uh, Stephen Crichton, Brian Toto, Dylan Brown, Jerome Hughes, Mitch Barnett, Reese Robson, Joseph Tapne, uh, Haumoli Olukwatu. Uh, Britton Nikura and Cam Murray as the team. Anyone missing out? I can see from the teams that are left, you know, the Broncos, maybe someone like Carrigan, the yeah. Roosters, obviously I went against Tedesco, but, uh, or Gus Crichton, maybe someone <laughs> there, like Tupo and Young did all good. <clears throat> Any of those last minute changes you guys want to make? No, I, I think it's personal preference as well, too, to be honest. Um, yeah, the, the picks I picked is because I feel like what if you if you put a team together and you look at it in your team and how they can all benefit from each other. But then you also, when I spoke about Drew Marshall King and having someone like Adam Fanor Black and Joseph Tarpney, and then then you got your back rows and your lock, like I th feel like they can add value to the the team. So it's more personal preference, and it'll be great to like see everyone else's team too on the show is to try and chuck us some feedback on. Rather than feedback on our team, maybe chuck up their team, you know what I mean? And um, try and pick it's a good I think exercise. It's, because I think it's harder, like, you know, I mix, mixed and matched a few teams because I wanted to put people in certain positions. And the biggest one that I had obviously a lot of trouble on was that sixth position. I nearly left it open because I was open to suggestions around the sixth position. Um, so it'd be nice to see everyone else. Um, come up with their team rather than either comment on ours. Well, can comment on ours and say what you think of ours, but also just to chuck up theirs and compare it and see where, what they look like because it's good to see what other people think as well, especially people that are just watching as fans and we have a different thinking as in former players on why we would choose these guys, not only of what they do in, in their games or the 80 minutes, but how they can help and affect the team I guess, combinations and where we see that they can be of benefit for the team. So it'll be exciting. Good exercise, eh, Willie? Yeah, real good. Well, best things you've done this year. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, let us know, guys. Uh, put your teams. Make sure it's one player per club because that's... Otherwise, you'll comment have. on there and tell them to go away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I'll delete your comment and I'll ban you from the channel. And then, no, I'm joking. I won't do that. We much. need all the subscribers yeah, we yeah, can, mate. Exactly. Don't be trying to ban people. <laughs> Nah, that's no, us, just, eh? Yeah, that's us. Well, that's us. Enough of listening to home. That's another show here on Run Australia. Make sure you jump over to wherever you get your podcasts from as well. Uh, thank you for all our guys that tuned in this morning. Make sure you s put your team down. Um, another beautiful show here on Run Straight. Our teams are done. Finals football's coming to second week. Make sure you support your team. Uh, leave some feedback. Subscribe to us. Apple Podcasts, run it straight on YouTube, and then my TikTok for all our lives. So thank you so much, Farno. Appreciate you guys coming in again. Cha-cha-cha. 